Open Door welcomes Cassandra McDonald. She is the president of the Lawyers Foundation and a civil rights activist. And she's here to tell us about the Legal Navigator Housing Crisis Campaign. So before we get into the campaign, just give us a little bit of background on the Lawyers Foundation. Well, the Lawyers Foundation was started in 2012 with the primary focus on the criminal uh, judicial system as opposed to the civil um, litigation judicial system. And what we do is we focus on expanding legal assistance by information, not advice, by information to underserved and underrepresented communities to ensure that they have uh, equity in the courtrooms and help them navigate through their court issues. Okay, that's that's kind of interesting because, you know, as people in this community, we all often find ourselves having to go through some type of legal process. And as we go through our education system, we learn very little about that. So when those things happen, we don't really have a, a huge base of information to act upon to navigate that. So that sounds very important. Uh, what kinds of things are you letting folks know about? And I know you just gave us a snippet of it, but what kinds of things can do they face when they go through that process? Well, number one, I think it's important for individuals to understand Um, especially our judicial system, that uh, legal navigators, as well as any courtroom advocates, are necessary um, in in our judicial system. The reason being is that we all know that a lot of individuals cannot afford the cost of an attorney, especially in civil litigation cases, which could go on for months, if not years, before they are settled. And when we look at what is going on specifically with the housing crisis that we have today, I think legal navigators are very essential to positive outcomes with what's looming ahead. You know, we have a legal aid society which helps individuals uh, do complete forms and, you know, help them as well kind of navigate through the system. But what makes us different is that we have people that act as caseworkers and case managers that not only help with the legal process, but we kind of walk them through the end of the cases like a a continuum of care, but continuum of legal advocacy throughout their whole entire case. And I think it's, it's necessary because you have to think about the population and the education with the legal process. And if we give them a sheet of paper and we give them documentation and say, here, take this, and we drop, you know, just leave the case, then where does that leave the client? And a lot of times they lose their homes because they don't know what else to do. Yes. But when you talk about law, you're talking about a language that is specific to lawyers. And then you also have the, the issue of literacy because many folks in our community are not as literate as they could be. So that that creates an additional challenge when it comes to interpreting the, the information uh, that they're receiving as they go through the process. You know, that was one of the, the main deficiencies that we did see is something as simple as missing a timeline or misinterpreting, as you stated, what certain legal terminology meant, and that caused individuals to, you know, get evicted. And we have to also take into consideration that the majority, if not all, of our municipal courts that handle housing situations, such as um, landlord-tenant issues, they do not have... um, I would say, quote unquote, law that says that they must have legal representation during these cases, except for the city of Cleveland. So that's another thing that we need to look at. And as a matter of fact, I'm proposing legislation to multiple municipalities, especially now, to have legal counsel available for uh, landlords and tenants during housing court. So are you saying that it is required that you have legal representation in the city of Cleveland as you go through that? process? Yes, they, it's, it's not necessarily a requirement, but it's, it's uh, allowable. A lot of these uh, housing courts, again, housing courts, I should say again, do not allow for that. Cleveland was the first housing court to do that. And I think it's time for all municipal housing courts to, to come on board, especially now when the eviction moratorium ends in December. Okay. 
And with that idea of having legal uh, representation, there's also the issue of cost. I mean, you know, lawyers don't come cheap uh, and not everyone can afford a lawyer. So how do you deal with that aspect of it? Well, this, this is why we need the courts to work with the Legal Navigators Program. So, again, um, there's a difference between what a legal navigator can do and, of course, what a lawyer can do. So a lawyer can advise a client on, you know, what they should do to have a better outcome of their case, whereas legal navigators provide information and choices because the first choice might be, um, you know, too expensive or they don't understand how to go about it. So we give them options. And, again, we're there through the whole case. So I think it's vital now with the changes that we are seeing in the way that we do courtroom proceedings that navigators are there to be a liaison between the lawyer, the judge, all courtroom actors, and the person that is um, the litigant. Okay. So let's talk about the high housing crisis. Uh, you've come up with this idea in order to address it. Tell our listening audience exactly uh, what uh, that crisis is about. Okay. So the crisis, of course, comes at the um, wake of the COVID-19 pandemic that we are seeing. And as uh, we know, you know, there was a lot of individuals who lost employment or lost their place of business. You saw individuals losing their home. You saw more individuals applying for unemployment. So that tells anyone, should tell anyone that what should we expect at the year's end? Because we still really haven't gotten a handle on anything where we're barely making it. So Cuyahoga County already has a high number of homeless cases. And again, with the end of the um, eviction and rent moratorium that is scheduled to end December I believe 31st, 2020, what are we going to do when landlords start filing evictions on t- against tenants who have not paid their rent? So what we're trying to do as legal navigators is, number one, step in as mediators between not just the landlord and tenant, but also the mortgage, mortgage companies that the landlords may have, you, you know, their um, loans through to see if, you know, if we come up with some forbearances, um, you know, if the courts would be, you know, um, willing to be more lenient against the landlord so that they won't feel that without their rent, they cannot cover their mortgage and therefore they have no choice but to evict a tenant. So we're, we're kind of, you know, looking at ways to uh, curtail this by, again, being in place um, as mediators as well as preparing the documentation that is required for individuals to take the court to have a fighting chance against any cases brought against them. Yeah. You know, it really is a a precarious situation because, you know, in the past six months, we've we've seen so many folks uh, have the rug pulled out from under them, you know, uh, and some of us have resources that will allow us to to stay the course and then others don't. Um, And I'm just looking at, you know, a personal situation. You know, I'm paying rent in a space that depends on the public for support. And then all of a sudden, public can't come to that space to support it. Um, So, you know, you can't really generate income to cover the costs of having that space. And then you have a landlord that wants to get their rent every month. But as a tenant, you lose your ability to support the space. Um, the uh, The landowner is in a precarious situation because the the income is jeopardized. And then the bank who holds the mortgage is saying, well, you know, we want to get paid. So how do you how do you create a win win in, in that type of a situation? Well, here here's the thing. Um what is a win-win on an individual basis? Some people's win is just give me two more weeks and I'll be out instead of filing and then having something on my record that they file for eviction. So if I'm able to do that, if we're able to do that, that's a win. Some people want 
you know, um, I want to keep my property, um, but I want to go into a payment plan and I don't know how to address my landlord or even the landlord says, I don't know what to say or don't know um, the forms that I need for the mortgage companies. Okay, if we can help you do that, that's a win. If there is a situation where, you know, you have to move, but maybe we can identify some, you know, financial resources, some other places where you can, you know, they can rent space, that's a win for them. So a win is going to come in, in multiple ways. Now, a lot of times, no, we're, we're not going to be able to uh, give the landlord and or the tenant the outcome that they would like. But I think in this case, especially, again, with the lack of education or people even not being in this situation previously, to say, hey, we, we get it, we know, these are your alternatives. You don't feel like they have alternatives. That's when you run into a lot of bad situations. So we want to make sure that, again, we start off with, you know, filing the documentation table. Okay, let's say this eviction, so you hear what this person has to say. You know, we assign volunteers, we have for mediation. We explain courtroom processes and procedures, provide feedback, resources, you know, and, and go from there. And hopefully that will give them some type of feeling that they have leverage over the way that their um, life chance opportunities will come out to be. Okay. So you're uh, obviously raising funds for this. Uh, tell us how folks can contribute to your fundraising effort. Okay, well, right now, uh, there's a few ways that you can contribute, but uh, this is the primary way. We are involved in um, campaigning through IOB.org. That's I-O-B as in boy, Y.org. You can um, go online there, and in the search bar, type L-A-W-R-S for lawyers, L-A-W-R-S. And if you hit the, um, the search button, you'll see our information come up. We are in a match program with IOB.org. So if you, you know, donate $1, we get $2. If you donate $500, we get $1,000. And, and, you know, it's very important, especially now. And we're trying to beat the um, winter season, which is like right here. And this money will go towards gift cards for clients and families for food, um, equipment and supplies, you know, for things that we need to keep our program going. They will assist with court filing fees for clients um, and, you know, just, just the things that we need to ensure that families' needs are met. Another way that you can make a donation is uh, simply by we take, um, you know, checks, money orders, um, and we do have an address for that, which is 5121 Mayfield Road, Suite 141, and that is in Mayfield Heights, Ohio, 44124. And I can also leave, you know, a telephone number if anybody missed that information to donate as well. Okay, leave the phone number right quick. Okay, that phone number is area code 440-682-0291. Okay, I'm going to write that down and uh, post it when this, this show goes into podcast form. Uh, you're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Cassandra McDonald. She is president of the Lawyers Foundation and the Civil Rights Activist right here in Cleveland. And we're going to come back and talk about some other things that are going on in the Cleveland area right after this. You're listening to Open Door on 95.9 FM, WOVU. WOVU 95.9 FM. Find us on Facebook. Like our page. Leave us a comment. We are WOVU 95.9, streaming live on WOVU.org. When you're in my car, we're listening to WOVU 95.9 FM. We're back on Open Door with Vince Robinson and our guest, Cassandra McDonald, president of the Lawyers Foundation and a civil rights activist here in Cleveland. And before we took the break, she was just telling us how we could uh, make donations to the Legal Navigator Housing Crisis Campaign. You know, it's it's really kind of odd that that this moratorium would end on December 31st in the dead of winter. 
you know, and really jeopardize the lives of, of folks who, you know, it's it's just the worst time of year to be evicted. Uh, you know, they have programs where they won't allow utilities, utilities to be shut off during certain times of the year. You would think that they would look at this in a similar way, but, you know, bank want their money, so <laughs> you got to pay, right? Here, yes, you're absolutely <laughs> correct. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, it's kind of odd. Um, but anyway, uh, IOB is, is a great uh, entity because they've been able to uh, help a lot of folks through some funding issues. So um, I, I want you to offer that information one more time so those who didn't get it on the first try can get it again. Okay, so to make an online donation, you can actually go on to IOB.org and that's IOB. I-O-B-Y dot org, type in L-A-W-R-S for lawyers, look for us and scroll down to make your donation, or you can get more information to make a donation by dialing 440-682-0291. Again, that's 440-682-0291 for the Lawyers Foundation. Okay. So, uh... Ms. McDonald, you know, I shared this with you uh, before we began this interview, but I just wanted to state it publicly. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for for one like you who sees things going on in our community and decides, well, we got to do something about that. And then you do. So you've seen this this need uh, for folks who are are having issues uh, in terms of housing Uh, But you also serve in the capacity of uh, president of an NAACP chapter here in Cleveland. And I know there are some things in in Euclid that are going on, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to address some of the deficits that are in that community and things that you're doing to address those deficits. Okay, yes, and thank you so much. Um, You know, as I said, and I'm very humbled that you would even, uh, you know, consider me like that. Um, because I am very passionate about what I do, and but because I'm serious about doing it. So, you know, just to recognize someone to appreciate the efforts against the other things that I face in completing the work, you know, that means a lot to me. So, so thank you for saying that. So, oh my gosh, as far as the city of Euclid, yes, um, I am still heavily involved there, um, and there has been some ground um, breaking work that has, um, I can say that we, we've gotten some things done that were concrete. Um, as recent as maybe two months ago, I had noticed that there was a law on the books that required individuals with felony convictions and or some misdemeanors to register with the city of Euclid, their place of residency, and to disclose what their um, past conviction was. This is nothing current, nothing that they were actually going to court for, but something that they had been tried, convicted, and even served their sentence. So I I found that to be rather discriminatory in the sense that Euclid is comprised of more than 60% Black, as well as that we all know how mass incarceration has affected um, people of color. So nine times out of 10, think about who was required to register. Secondly, I address the fact that the state of Ohio does not require anyone with a felony conviction to register in any municipality. So why would Euclid do it? And I, you know, basically said that that's going against what the constitution says. So um, long story short, the whole chapter was repealed, which means that it's not even on the books anymore. They removed the whole law off the books. So I'm, I'm glad to have accomplished that because to me it was just another way to target. And for what the law was made for originally back in the 1950s, um, and this is 2020, we can you know kind of give a um, guesstimation of why it was even put in place in the, you know originally yeah i was gonna Um, i was gonna ask about that because i mean (laughs) i know we live in america and i know there's a a system of racism that's been in place for a long time but that just seems so draconian that you would require someone who's served their their debt to society 
and is moving forward with their life, but then you want to force them to carry a label and uh, to be on a uh, a, a register uh, or a log of someone who has the potential to do something wrong. Absolutely. And, you know, you think about it just what last year, you know, another law, the marijuana law and how they punished that, you know, that was found out through a podcast. And then I got involved and they want, they, you know, removed that law as well. So, you know, the state only requires arsonists and, you know, people who are on the sex offender list to register. So, so, I mean, you're going, they were going, stepping over the state requirements. So, I'm glad that um, the council people worked with me and we were able to remove that. Mm -hmm. And I did propose several other pieces of legislation, which actually would be heard a second time October 21st, I think, which is very vital to the city of Euclid. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. What was the marijuana law? So the marijuana law, the the reason that was... uh, Something that had to be removed is because the punishment for the amount of marijuana that if they found it, the punishment was egregious and it overstepped the state law. So in any municipal ordinances, such as the Ohio Administrative Code versus the state law, which is the Ohio Revised Code, the the municipal law cannot be more or over what state law uh, provisions for punishment is, and it was. So um, they were uh, pretty much exceeding what the requirements would be for punishment if someone was caught with a certain amount of marijuana. So it, so was, again, it was for possession then? Yes, it was for possession. Mm-hmm. And this is against the decriminalization of possession up to a certain amount uh, in the city of Cleveland. So if you cross the border and you possess you go from Cleveland to Euclid and you possess, then you face possible jail. Well, well, this is this. It was more of this. So let's say that um, I'm the state and the state says, I'm telling you that if you're caught with one gram of marijuana, I can only sentence you to six months in jail. But the Euclid, let's say Euclid municipality says here, if you get caught with one gram, I'm going to sentence you to one year the municipal government will be out of line and actually would be in violation of the constitution because they cannot over, they cannot exceed the punishment of state law. And that's what the city of Euclid was doing with that particular marijuana ordinance. Yes. Well, you know, and I'm not advocating uh, using marijuana, but I just want to illustrate this point. You know, there are states in this country where it's legal. And then there are mm-hmm. states in this country where it isn't. And now you have cities where it's legal and cities in proximity where it isn't. And this is one of my frustrations with America. It's the lack of uniformity, you know, and the injustice that results in a higher proportion of African-Americans or black people being in jail for something that really shouldn't even be a crime, you know, and why is it that in 2020 we're still wrestling with this, this, um, it's just, it's an inequity. I'll just put it, I'll use that term. It's an inequity because they haven't addressed it at a federal level. And we spend our time on so many other issues, for instance, and I'm just, this is just my, my mind at work. I'm thinking about, the futility of an impeachment that happened last year. They went through all of that to impeach a president who's still in office. They wasted all that time with something that went absolutely nowhere when they could have been focusing on something else. They went through that whole impeachment proceeding at a time when a virus was being spread all around the world. And this country did not address that virus the way they should have, when they should have. And now here we are where we are. So I don't know. You know, I think part of the issue is the notion of states' rights, which was just uh, a cloak for the perpetuation of a system of slavery that was supposed to end that didn't. 
And here we are, you know, 150 years later or so, uh, still dealing with the same kinds of issues. So sorry about the tangent, but I was just just thinking out loud how ridiculous it is to be in Cleveland and have a certain amount and it's okay, but then cross the border and all of a sudden. And then what you said is that not only can you be arrested for it, but you would have a longer penalty and a greater impact on your family because of something that should not be illegal in the first place. Right. That's if the city um, was in violation of the state law. Absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, but, you know, you saw a deficit there and then you brought it to the, the attention of city council and you were able to have an impact on legislation, which brings me to another uh, idea. And that is um, the importance of legislation and the importance of us being in positions to have impact on legislation and policy. If you have a city that's 60 percent black, what does the city council look like? And I can probably venture to say that the the city council of Euclid is not 60 percent black. Um, No, it isn't. Actually, um, there are two African-American males one African-American female, and I believe there are, including the council president, um, that are uh, white. So we have, uh, and the clerk, if you want to add the clerk and the mayor, you're looking at eight against three. Mm-hmm. So when, when you talk about legislation um, and legislation being written and presented, even if the... Um, you know, the, the legislators or the council people, I should say, who are black proposes something, and I'm proposing it to a majority of individuals who do not identify with what I'm trying to say in the legislation and why this legislation is necessary, especially in a municipality where racial tensions have been historical, then that, it's going to be a fight for them as well because they're not going to um, get it or they don't want to get it, which I have seen personally where he, where this particular individual didn't want to, want to um, understand or had a problem identifying the place that I was coming from with why this legislation needed to be addressed. Um, and I'll give you the example. So in September, um, I proposed at least 12 items that needed to be changed, whether it's in legislation or whether it's, it was in the collective bargaining agreement. And as a matter of fact, I uh, personally went through the whole um, Euclid charter and all of the administrative codes that, that they have. I took time out to do that. And that's how I got to kind of understand more about where the dysfunction was. So I proposed um, these two critical things. One was that all the police officers had to have body cameras, and they, the body cameras have to be able to turn on by themselves automatically and stay on. And even if another officer didn't have theirs on, if another officer was in a certain uh, vicinity with theirs on, it would automatically cut the other officer's body cameras on. I found out that the city of Euclid does not require their officers to have body cams, nor does the mayor of Euclid consider it even important to. So I wrote legislation for that. Um, Councilman Marcus Epps, you know, took it to his colleagues, and they did have a hearing on it, which was, uh, and it was Ordinance 112-20. And so when the council, uh, other council people heard it, they said, you know what, yes, you know, we, we like this because think about it, you know, I'm sure they're tired of the controversy. So they just said, okay, we will, you know, second this for another motion. Well, there was one particular council um, councilman who said that everybody, now listen to this, everyone that he has talked to in Euclid says that they don't think they're necessary. Okay. Well, that's a severe... Hold up, hold up. <laughs> they don't think that body cams are necessary. Okay. No. I, I, I want you to hold that thought because we got to take a break real quick. I want you to hold that thought, but when you come back, you're going to give us that recommendation and another recommendation on something that needs to change. You're listening to Open Door Cleveland with Vince Robinson and our special guest, Cassandra McDonald of the Lawyers Foundation. We'll be right back. 
This is Aja Jones, Tracy Clark, Kiko, Shalonda Armstrong, Brian Webster. This is T.C. Lewis, and you are listening to WOVU 95.9 FM. We're not always on the same side of issues, but that's the great thing about being a democracy. But we can all agree on this. The 2020 census is important to everyone. An accurate count determines how many seats our state has in Congress. It also helps inform how billions of dollars in public funding get distributed annually. For things that make our daily lives better, like walk-in clinics, preschool and after-school programs, affordable housing, and hundreds of other programs. So we can all agree, participating in the 2020 Census is important for so many reasons. To find out how you can participate, visit 2020census.gov. Shape your future. Start here. Okay, we're back with Cassandra McDonald. And before we broke, she was telling us how there was an element of Euclid City Council, someone who decided that body cams might not be necessary. Could you expand on that? Yes, um, actually, it was the mayor also. The mayor uh, did, doesn't think they're necessary. And, you know, this is not just my words. It, it's actually written during the council meeting because they're recorded that she felt that way, as well as a council member who said that, again, he has spoken to everyone in you, everybody he spoke to didn't feel that way. Well, your ward versus another ward that may be predominantly black in ward two, versus predominantly white in Ward 4, if you say you spoke to everybody in Ward 4, you're not speaking to the population. And I guarantee you that everybody in Euclid did not say that body cameras are necessary. So that right there is a thinking distortion that we have to get out of council. That's, you know, it didn't even make any sense to me. So long story short with that, you know, I... um offered my insight. I said, well, it depends on how you look at it. You know, if, if you can tell me um, 100% sure that your officers are so good and so well disciplined and that there's never been an issue here at all with uh, police brutality or anything like that, then I, I would give you some points for that. But I don't think you can. And I said also from the point of protecting a police officer, sometimes it's not always about you know, the person that's being arrested, but also the officer. What if things happen a different way for them and you don't have it recorded? But the fact that, to me, he immediately became hostile towards the fact and became defensive that we would even suggest that all officers had to have cameras, then I questioned his motive on counsel. So, but I did get that passed through, and it will be getting heard um, October 21st for a second hearing. Okay. Well, I, I bet you they they probably get nervous when they see you walking in the, in the room. What What is she going to come with now? But, you know, it, it's that kind of spirit. I, I, and I'm, I'm just thinking about Fannie Lou Hamer right now. I mean, she got to a point where she couldn't take it anymore and said, we got to do something about this. And so, you know, some of us have the right to vote now because of what Fannie Lou Hamer had, the energy that, that she had. So, um, the body cameras, it's, it's, a, it's an accountability measure. I mean, you know, yeah. they say the camera doesn't lie. You know, if you uh, and you, you also have the, the backdrop of incidents that have happened with Euclid police involving uh, motorists who were were beat down unjustifiably in the eyes of some. So, you know, sometimes you can just roll the tape, see what really happened. And then you you know what happened. And then you have you know, cell phone camera footage and, and all the other things that, that also point out the same kinds of things. But for someone to say that, well, the, the, the cameras aren't necessary, it means that perhaps you have something to hide. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you mentioned another measure that uh, you were, were exploring. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is the second one. So, again, I, I put about 14 up, you know, and they're all going to be heard, you know, consecutively. But the other one that's going to be up, I believe, also on October 21st is that um, currently in the majority of charters in uh, Cleveland and Greater Cleveland, the Civil Service Commission members are appointed 
and selected solely by the mayor without any other individual input as to who is being selected to serve on the Civil Service Commission. And I, I find that I find that is not appropriate, especially for the days and times that we live in regarding a lot of relationships, political relationships, um, you know, uh, familial relationships, things of that nature that can impede that. And we've seen that with the, uh, on the Cleveland consent decree when we talk about nepotism and different things like that. So, you know, we need to be careful. Um, so what I propose is that anybody that the mayor brings up to be appointed to serve on the Civil Service Commission, that the council members must approve them. And if anybody doesn't understand what the Civil Service Commission does, they are the body that actually hears not just the hiring and termination of, you know, um, let's say uh, regular civil service employees, but also your police officers, your, your firefighters, and so forth. So when we think about arbitration, if you looked at the majority of the collective bargaining agreements, any complaints against an officer, once the grievance is filed, it goes to arbitrators. And arbitrators are outside bodies that are mediators, so to speak, and they are hired through the city selected by the mayor to come in and iron out differences. Now, we all know that we're not liking arbitrators when it comes to community policing, but it's not all the arbitrators' fault. Um, it's the qualified immunity and other things What I I'll get into at another show. But arbitrators um, basically say, I'm going to fight, or this is why this officer should or should not get their job back. Now, what's the purpose of the Civil Service Commission, then, if they do the same thing? And I think that we are underutilizing the power of the Civil Service Commission. And as a matter of fact, this is something that I have, um, I'm writing state law about to take out certain language within a collective bargaining agreement so that the Civil Service Commission should hear all cases first and then decide if an officer should be terminated and if they are terminated by the Civil Service Commission member, which all municipalities have, then the only way they get their job back is to appeal it in the Court of Common Pleas. So why are we spending taxpayers' money? Why are we, you know, um, having these individuals in arbitration decide what's best for us in our communities and cities, and they don't come from there? Use your Civil Service Commission. That's what they're there for. They're not just there to hear happy cases and this person got a promotion no you're here to to do your job as far as discipline disciplining employees as well and we're not doing that mm. you know uh a lot of what you're talking about comes back to um the necessity for our involvement in process and one of those things is voting and running for office so if you have a community like euclid that, as we've said earlier, was 60 percent black, but you don't have uh, a proportional representation in city government. You have one or two or three uh, black folks on council and it's an 11 member council. They're in a position to be outvoted every time, even though they're speaking about the issues. So I'm just just realizing as as we have this conversation how important it is for us to be engaged in politics and engaged in that in that process. Um, hold on one moment. I, I'm getting a call uh, <laughs> from a telemarketer, so uh, I had to. Okay, we're good. So anyway, I, w the thought was, you know, we have to be in a position to to enforce the things that 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 we uh, address in in terms of legislation or policy or whatever. But if we're we're not represented to an adequate extent, then you know, it's it's like we're operating in a vacuum. Um, what do you think is it's going to take to get folks more engaged in 
and involved in in politics in a city like Euclid? Well, for me, number one, um, we have to get them back enthused about their participation in politics, Um, not only how politics affect them, but show them how they can make even the slightest change and that even the slightest change is worth something to them. Um, And I think we're failing in that way. I think also that the current political machine take that seriously because that's exactly what is happening, where there is a um, subgroup of individuals who, um, no matter how much they um, mingle with their constituents, no matter how many functions they show up to, the bottom line goal for them is to maintain my seat, whether I'm right or wrong. So we have to do our due diligence in being um, not only supporting and loving of individuals who we want to see in the seat, but also be stern enough about your life and how them being in in the seat affects you. So I can love you all day and like you as a friend, but when I look out my window and I see yellow tape and chalk lines, and I know this is your ward, I have to tell you about yourself. And we have to be honest about what these people are doing in office and not being afraid that I'm going to step on their toes because that's one person. This is a ward or a county or a municipality with how many people. It's not just about them. It's about us out here, and we're selling in that way. I think another thing, too, is to start with the fundamental education about what your leaders do. What does a mayor really do? What is their responsibility? What is the responsibility of a state rep? What is the responsibility of a senator? How do I know what district I'm in? How do I know what precincts I'm in? What do they do? Because a lot of times we're taking our anger and gripes to the wrong person because we don't know. And if we don't know what they actually are supposed to do according to their, um, their seat, then what questions will you ask when you're trying to vet the right candidate? We can't keep having questions like, well, you know, they didn't pick up my trash the other day. What do you plan to do about it? Okay. They'll tell you, oh, I'm going to get right on that. How about asking them this? So, you know, I was looking at your ordinance, and it says that, you know, this has to be done by this period of time, and that's ordinance 11369. How how does that benefit me? Can you explain to me how that goes? We're not answering the right right questions because if I want to hold the seat like any other job, I need to know my my position and what I'm supposed to do like the back of my hand, if not close to it. And these politicians and a lot of people in office don't because they don't take the time out to study their craft and study what they're supposed to do. And that deficit hurts us in the long run. Yes. And, you know, that's a that's a great point because people don't know what functions certain folks have so you know when the garbage isn't being picked up someone will call their councilman but it may not be the councilman's responsibility to deal with that issue so council people get dumped on and you know the 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 purpose of the council person is to write legislation and to you know determine policy so they end up getting overworked and phone ringing off the hook. And part of it is because folks don't know who's supposed to do what. Absolutely correct. And, you know, and it is hard, you know, in office because you're not going to be able to please everyone. So I'm not going to beat up on the ones that's there. I'm just saying, you know, we need to rethink our purpose, our place, and our position. Mm -hmm. Rethink it. Because if, if it's not in line with, the ultimate goal and what you're really trying to do um, and what people need, you may need to find something else. And that's where I'm at with it right now. Hold that thought uh, because we we're coming up on another break right now, but I want to talk about that a little bit further when we return. You're listening to open door Cleveland with Vince Robinson and our guest Cassandra McDonald. We'll be right back. We are W O V U 95.9 FM. Our voices united. United to enhance our community. United to be a beacon of hope. United to empower our community. WOVU 95.9. 
our voices united. We're back with Cassandra McDonald, president of the Lawyers Foundation and the president of the Euclid branch of the NAACP. Um, I just want to revisit what we were talking about before we broke, because we have a lot of folks who are in public office who are not the definition of public servants. And I'm also aware of the fact that many folks who are in office spend a majority of their time or a significant amount of their time raising funds to continue uh, their position, but not necessarily addressing the needs of constituents. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what the motivation for serving in public office should be? Uh, I think that the motivation for in office should address what you may have seen or experienced personally and say, you know what, I don't like this. I, I think, let me find a way to change it because if you've experienced it nine times out of ten, somebody else experienced it. So, so let's see what we can do about it. Um, the other thing is to have a passion to talk to people and learn what concerns them, talk to them about the changes they need, because oftentimes what we think would be, be best for someone is not what they're looking for. And a lot of times they're running on, you know, yeah, you know, this, this has to be changed. And you get into a meeting with some of the senior citizens or even youth and anybody in between, and they say, well, no, um, that's not our biggest concern. We, just, we really want this to happen. So you want to make sure that your energy is focused in the right direction. I think another um, motivational piece for me would be is to, you know, think about and, and do it systematically. Like think about uh, from street bureaucracy um, all the way to the state level. Because, again, even though we, if you're in city council or you're on a municipal level, the changes that you make are so impactful, you know, that they, they reach a broader audience or they, they reach other people to think about an idea to correlate with yours so that change can start being affected on multiple levels. So when you run for office, you really want to think about what is it that you see that needs attention? What aren't we addressing that we should have? And if we have addressed it, you know, what has been the stumbling block where we can't get it accomplished? You, you really have to be focused on people's agenda. Let the people set your agenda. Don't always set the agenda. Let the people set the agenda. When you, when you do that, you fare better than trying to, um, I want to make a name for myself. Yes, you want to be known, but making a name for yourself, you don't want to be a celebrity. You want to be, I'm a politician, I'm doing my job, and if I happen to do it well enough and people know me, that's an extra bonus. But my position is to be the best, politician, public figure, whatever it is that I am. That should be the goal. Okay. So right now we have a system in place where there are basically two parties. uh, And um, a lot of times when it comes to voting, people vote because they recognize a name and that name may have been connected to a certain period or a certain party over a period of time. Um, But I have noticed that you have an idea to change this paradigm, do you want to talk about uh, your plans in re- in relation to another political party? Well, actually, um, there there has been uh, several individuals in a group that came um, to me about forming a new party, and it turned out to be a press release uh, for them. And we they're still in discussion, and I think within the next week or so. Um, I'll be able to elaborate more on that, but it's definitely there's definitely a new party on the rise, and I, I I believe, and I can't speak for you know the majority of individuals, but I believe that not only was this coming, this was like writing on a wall, but the time has evolved and arrived for it to be here. So that makes me um, excited about what to look forward to. Okay, why do you think? Uh, that a third party is necessary, and what do you think it could accomplish? Well, I think it's necessary because of choices, and I feel that 
especially with this presidential election, people feel blighted by the choices that they have um, at the presidential level. And I really don't um, get much into, um, you know, who I would vote for, um, but I, I can say I don't like what's happening in an office. And since 2000, maybe 14 or 15, I have not been a Trump fan. So that's how I'll say that. Um, but I think that the choices, when we look at our choices, um, and when we look very early, you know, early on into the, um, you know, when it was the nomination for the presidency. And in Cuyahoga County, I think this started the buzz with people wanting to have a third party is when um, Senator Harris was endorsed by the Democratic Party. And many felt that it was premature because all candidates had not been submitted and they had already made a choice for her to run as president. And um, as we quickly found out, it, it did not, you know, it didn't transpire. And there was this issue about the unions and, you know, crossing the line during um, a visit when uh, Senator Harris was scheduled to come here. So it, it got kind of iffy. And then when we looked at, you know, the Republican Party and you saw how the Senate was behaving um, towards black, the black agenda and black issues. We, we got deflated there and then come, you know, George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor and all these things that happen. And we're looking at how both sides are responding. Then here is COVID. So we got to see both parties in action in a way that we had not experienced before. And when we're looking at everything, we're feeling deflated, whether we're Democrat, you identify as Democratic or whether you identify as Republican. And right now, even though people are sticking with who they are or switching depending on what they want, the fact of the matter is people are feeling like, this is what I have, so if I don't want to go hungry, so I might as well eat it. And that should not be how people feel in a democracy where they should have a voice. So people are looking for alternatives, and an alternative is here um, soon in Cuyahoga County. And again, I can't wait to bring that up. Yes. Well, you know, it, it's really interesting when, when you talk about the issue of choice. Uh, and I was just thinking earlier this year as I watched the primary season unfold and everything that happened, you know, there's a certain amount of inequity uh, in that Iowa starts the ball rolling and people in Iowa have so many different choices to make when it comes to who they would like to see run as they're tied to a specific party. By the time things get to Ohio, we have fewer choices because other folks have weeded out candidates or people ran out of money or the polls decided that, you know, that this person wasn't didn't have what it took to to continue in, in the campaign or whatever. So it just seems that this, the whole system is is kind of from my perspective, it's a bit screwed up. And then you have folks like Ice Cube who come along and say, well, you know, we shouldn't just be giving away our votes. And I think that's another issue that's very prevalent. You know, um, we traditionally, since the, the, the late 60s, the mid to late 60s, have aligned ourselves with the Democrat Party. But the Democrats don't always deliver. And we don't hold the Democrats accountable. But then when you talk about having a third party, they say, well, you know, we're going to lose some of the power that we have because uh, the, the vote is fractioned. So how can a third party contribute to success from from your perspective? Well, first of all, when we talk about losing power, what power do you have? What power does the Democratic have? when the Senate is controlling what they do. So that's limited power. And also they put themselves in a position to have limited power because of the fact that people are getting away from the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. Now, when it comes to Ice Cube and what he said, I thought about it. And I remember something that happened here in our elections with the blackout, where voters had pretty much, there was a campaign and they refrained, um, black voters were refrained from voting. It happened with one of the, I think it was Senator Strickland, it was one of those. And until we got what we wanted, 
it was black voters would not make a vote in this particular election, not across the board, but this particular election until we got what we wanted and it wound up working out. Now, when Ice Cube made his statement, I said, well, is he saying the same thing? The problem is this election, this presidential election, is a much greater scale than a senator. So it was flawed in that particular um, ideology, but I understand the reasoning because we did it here in Cuyahoga County. So it, it wasn't new. But to say that in a presidential election, especially with who we have in office and what has been done in so much for us. As much as he gives, he taketh away. And I'm going to leave it right there. Yes. Because that's, that's, look at the overall uh, situation with him. He gives, but he takes away. And just like the promise he did with the HBCU, when everybody said, oh, okay, yeah, you know, he's got it. Now look, the, what he wrote as far as what was written in legislation, the HBCUs is actually not really going to be able to participate in any of that funding that he said would be available. So we have to look at it for what it is, not what we think it is or not what somebody tells us it is. We need to research. Yes. I, I agree with you. I, I think that what he said was probably on point, but the problem is the timing of it because you're not yeah. really in a position to, <laughs> to have any leverage right now because the decisions have already been made. Uh, another thing I just wanted to mention, and this is probably neither here nor there as Clayton Thomas would say. Uh, but, um, I saw a meme just last week and I had seen it a few, um, months before and it was a it was a photograph of a native american and the the sentiment was you know a bird has a left wing and a right wing but they're both on the same bird and and i think you know when it comes to politics in this country uh you know we put our faith on one side or another side but it's all the same system and when i look at what has happened to us in this country over a period of years, and I'm reflecting on the, the, the past 60 years, not a whole lot has changed in, in terms of our position in society. I mean, we're still the, the largest number of folks who are incarcerated. We're still categorically leading areas of dysfunction in, in education and in health and in other parts of, of our society. And the Republicans and Democrats have, it seems as though they have conspired to keep us where we are, no matter how much allegiance we want to give the, the Democrats. And another thing that I have observed as, as we're running out of time is the cyclical aspect of economics. You know, you had what came before Clinton. Clinton got into office and then all of a sudden the economy is booming. And then the Republicans came back in with Bush and the economy goes down and then Obama comes to the rescue and the economy takes off again. And here we are, you know, yes, the stock market is where it is, but unemployment is also where it is and businesses have gone out of business. So, you know, there's kind of a false narrative when it comes to where we are economically right now and we're on the precipice of the launch of a digital dollar which is already approved through legislation in the CARES Act and some other things that have happened so you know we're just really in a weird place but you know life goes on and hopefully with folks like you who are looking at legislation looking at the laws and seeing what the inequities are and coming forward to to make some adjustments we can see the progress that we need to see i'm very hopeful that the future is not going to be as bleak as it has been forecast to be uh, but all we can do is is keep moving keep stepping and and keep doing the right thing with the right intention uh, Cassandra McDonald, I want to thank you for taking this time with us. We've had a great conversation, and I look forward to future conversations. Uh, please keep doing what you do. I will, and thank you so much for having me 
you know, on the show. And as always, it's my pleasure speaking with you. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to Open Door Cleveland right here on 95.9 FM WOVU. Know yourself, love yourself, be yourself, make a great day. Peace.